Well, we have a good crowd here today. Uh, before I get started, uh, running my mouth, we'll go ahead and open up in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here to study your word, Lord. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word, Father, so that we may grow in grace, Father, and recognize error. I pray and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, and I say to recognize error because that is the number one thing that, that hurts the church today is error and false teachings. Uh, today's, uh, the name of the, today's study is Am I a Sinner? Uh, I've heard people say, um, <laughs> I'm not a sinner. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't go to confession. Well, they go to confession. Yeah, I, have, I have nothing to confess. I haven't sinned. Um, people have a faulty idea of what sin is. People just assume that sin is just something that you do bad. Well, I haven't hurt anyone. You know, as far as I know, I'm a good, you know, tax-paying citizen. I take care of my kids. I'm a good husband. I'm a good wife, and so on. So, what exactly is sin? Uh, uh, we'll get into the scriptures in a minute. It'll tell us what sin is. Uh, Sin is a failure to conform to the moral standards of God. And you know, the Ten Commandments, we all know what they are without me naming or listing them, but uh, you cannot keep the Ten Commandments, though we are commanded to keep them. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments because it is your heart, it is your disposition that makes you a sinner. It's not so much the very act that you do, but your very nature itself makes you a sinner. But, you know, we, we have this faulty view that, well, I haven't done anything wrong, so why am I a sinner? You know, I haven't hurt anyone or I haven't done anything. We're so used to putting sin in degrees, and there are degrees of sins, where, you know, well, if I haven't done any atrocities like this, then I'm okay. You know, I may have had a few little mistakes. But understand that God's holiness demands perfection. Now, we're quick to say that we're, and I'm not a sinner, but no one will say I'm perfect. You won't find too many people who say that they're perfect. And the thing is, you absolutely have to be perfect to stand before God. So, but again, we look at each other and we look at other people and that's how we judge ourselves. I could never do anything like that. So obviously, I'm not a sinner. I'm okay. But we're going to see what the Bible says about sin. And am I a sinner? Because we have to understand what we are and who we are in the sight of God to appreciate and understand his doctrines. If I think that I'm okay and I'm not a sinner, then I, can, then I can't accept the doctrine of sin then I cannot accept uh, election because I, if I'm not that bad, then I can choose God. So everything becomes untangled. So you have to understand who you are first and foremost before you can appreciate the thing that God has done for before we can actually appreciate and know what grace is. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to read, uh, I'm going to read verse 5. And it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, when you read that, you think, well, that's just somebody that's thinking bad thoughts, and, and you know, he's thinking about murder, or he's thinking about rape or adultery. So that, that's what they're talking about. It, it, says, it says every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every intent. So if you intend, you want to do something from somebody, I want to uh, bake some bread for the lady up the street. You know, she's a nice lady. She did something for me last week, so I feel obligated to do this. Okay, well, you're doing it because she did something for you last week. You're not doing it for the love of God. Say, God, I'm doing this because it pleases you. It is sin. It is sin. So you have to understand what sin is. Whatever you do, if it's not done for the love of God, it is sin. It doesn't matter what it benefits to the next person. You have to understand what is sin. And when you understand what sin is, then the question, am I a sinner, is obviously, yes, I am. We're all sinners. All of us are sinners. The Bible teaches that we have all fallen short. Now, how can we all fall short? Because we're not perfect. <laughs> but God demands perfection. So in order to appease him, what do we need? A Savior. And our Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we're all our sinners. From the little ones all the way up, and, and I'll get to the little ones in a little, in a little bit. <laughs> now, stay in Genesis. Let's look at chapter 8. I'll look at verse 21. Reading these verses to clearly show Scripture teaches what we are. This is God's Word. 821. It says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. This is when he had destroyed, right before he destroyed everything, the flood. On the account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. Again, he's saying it again, just like we just read. For the intent of his heart is what is evil 
heart is evil from his youth. Now you notice God, this is the second, we're still in Genesis, but this is the second time he says from his youth that is evil. David said what? David said that I was born in iniquity, conceived in sin. Again, clearly teaching that no one is born perfect. No one. A baby who slumbers in his mother's womb, make no mistake, sin slumbers in the baby's breast. We are born against to hate God. You understand what I'm saying? So no one is exempt from sin. No one comes into the world perfect. We're all sinners. Again, am I a sinner? Yes, I am. We are sinners in the sight of God. God is clearly saying, and you notice God is talking about the heart. He's not necessarily talking about each deed that you do, but the heart, the intent. What is your heart? Again, if you do something nice for somebody, if you buy them a present because it's their birthday, or whatever, you do something because they've done something for you. Those are nice things in and of themselves. The person is happy for what you, but are you doing every single thing for the love of God? And if you're not doing every single thing for the love of God, putting him first, then why do we put him first? He gets us up. He allows us to go purchase the present. He allows us, we move and breathe through God. And we lose sight of that fact, you know, because we're so quick to give ourselves the credit. He allows us to move and to breathe this woman to come to do as she is. It's the grace of God. So, again, am I a sinner? Yeah, we're sinners. Make no mistake. God is totally saying this in his word. Now, go to Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 64, and we're we'll looking at 6 and 7. <coughs> And then I want to open the floor up for discussion because this is a, hopefully a good discussion about sin and, you know, understand what sin is and what makes us sinners. You know, we're sinners by our very nature. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. About the sin. About the sin. 64, 6 and 7. This is the Lord's, Lord's, the Lord's word. It says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds like a filthy garment. Now, again, I'm going to stop there about righteous deeds. What are our righteous deeds? Like what I just spoke about. Um, you, someone, you bake someone some bread. You, you bought someone a present. Uh, you helped someone out. You did a bake sale at the church. Uh, you passed the car, got destroyed. You gave one out of your garage that you had. And, and these, are, these are deeds. These are you know deeds that you do. But God is clearly saying here, he says, your righteous deeds, he said, they're what? They're like filthy rags. So, if my righteous deeds are like filthy rags, I just helped this one out. What do I have to do? But you have to do it for the love of God. You have to do it because the love of God burns in your heart to do this for this individual. And that's what we can't lay claim to. That's what we can't do. And that's what makes us a sinner. God demands perfection. So, and, and, and what the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that's the greatest commandment, right? So everything I do, Lord, I'm doing because I love you. Mm -hmm. But I can't love him until the new disposition is placed within me, until I am born again. So again, am I a sinner? Yes, we're all sinners. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the scripture says. Again, I'll read 6 and 7. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. So you can't look to what you do as far as, well, I did this and I did that. That's why the Bible says that no flesh will be justified in my sight. You can't stand before a holy God and say, well, I helped Joey up the street, you know. Or remember when I cured smallpox? Lord, that was a good thing. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to be perfect. You have to be perfect. And he says, there is no one who calls on your name who arouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. Which means that de delivered us into the power of our iniquities, that we are bondage, we are bound, we are slaves to sin. If someone does you wrong, it, it, it offends you, you're, you're upset, it bothers you. So you want something to happen, you want to get even and stuff like that. These are feelings and, and stuff that we can't change, but we can't change who we are. But it's sin in God's sight. Go to Jeremiah, and we'll look at Jeremiah 17, 9. And, and this is important. Remember in Genesis, I was reading um, where God said the intent of man heart is evil continually. Not, not just sometimes, continually. Continually. So if you look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Okay. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, and it's going right back to the heart. It says, the heart. Now hear me out. This is important. The heart. Okay, is more deceitful than all else. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to just stop before I finish reading. It says, the heart is more deceitful than all else. Why? Because that's what we depend on, our feelings. Well, this feels right and this is right. The bottom line has to be God's word, not our feeling. There are people who believe, well, I think this is right, or uh, it just feels right to me. I'll give you an example of someone who 
who is going through separation in their marriage, and, and, and the, the other party is not a believer. And, and they want the person to, you know, they want to be reconciled. And that's, that's a good thing. But the first thing you want to pray for is that God changes his heart or changes her heart. Because God is not going to bless it with the clearly teaches that we're not to but be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So he's not going to go back on that because you feel good about this person. No, God stands by his word. And that's what we're to ultimately trust. Not our feelings and how we feel, but his word. Why? He's smarter than we are. He knows what's best for us. We think we know what's best for us. But he ultimately knows what's best for us. He knows that there's things that we need to go through to grow in grace. So that's why I said the heart is more deceitful than all else. And the Bible also teaches, it says, guard your heart with all diligence. Okay. And it says, and it is desperately sick. It says, who can understand it? No one. You, you cannot understand it because that's what you go by, your feelings in your heart. And, and, you know, and then you're born again and God opens your eyes. It says, the Lord, the Lord searched the heart and tests the mind. It says, even to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. In other words, okay, according to his deeds, he trusts the heart. Now, why did you do this? Why did you help this person? Why did you do that? What's the motive behind it? If you're just doing it for selfish reasons or just doing it because, well, I did something for him last week, that's sin. It all has to be done for the love of God because he's worthy. So, now let's go to Job. We're going to look at Job 21. Okay. Again, and, and, you know, before I read Job, it's been said, read Job 21, I'll be reading 14 and 15. Um, for the most part, we look at television and we see how the world is and it's corrupt. And we, we, we might not necessarily live as wild and, and as recklessly as the next person. But you have to understand, we're no better than that person in the sight of God because we do have to be perfect. You know, we're born sinners because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, because of what Adam and Eve did, which plunged us into sin. It makes you a sinner the very fact that you grow old. Why? Because it's all a result of sin. If disease is all because of sin. Handicapped people is all because of sin. There's not anything that the individual has done, it's all because of sin. It's all because of sin. We wear glasses. Our eyes didn't fall. Why? Because of sin. God didn't create Adam and he was perfect state. Perfect state. Until he messed up and then sent into the world, and you got disease, you got sickness, you got arthritis, you got gray hair, and all the rest of it comes. It's not natural. God didn't create us to die, but it was because of sin. So, to put you, take yourself out of that category and say, I'm not a sinner. Oh, oh, you're an alien? Are you from another planet? You are a sinner. You are a sinner by nature. You, but David said, I was born and conceived in it. I think that covers the whole thing about our children uh, are baby sinners. Yes, they are. We were all babies, I was conceived in sin. We've all seen little children, right? You know how they act. If you don't, if you don't rear them right, you know how they're going to be, right? Hey, so why is that? Why are they going to be angry? Why are they going to be selfish? Why is that natural to them? Because they're born in sin. Like David said, I was conceived in sin. The Bible says from the youth, they go astray. No baby's born perfect. I mean, I haven't met a child, one year, who walks up just out of the blue and says, Mother, here's your slippers, Father, and just <laughs> like some little robot. That, that, that's, not even, you know, that's not even normal. No one would even believe that. Why? They're little rascals, right? <laughs> you know, they have to be taught morality in God's way because the bad stuff is already in them. You know, we're already geared against God, which gives credibility to the fact that Jesus says, What? Well, you must be born again. You need a new disposition so you, can, so you are able to love the Lord. And do things to please him. So again, we are all sinners. Doesn't mean that you went out and committed the worst crimes. You're still a sinner. You either a sinner or you're perfect. Nobody's, Nobody's perfect. perfect, right? <laughs> so then that's that's how you answer that. So we're going to Job 21. Now read 14 and 15. It says, "They say to God, Depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what will we gain if we entreat him?" And that's what people are saying today. We do not even des desire the knowledge of your ways. I don't want to hear nothing about the Bible today. People don't want to hear that. These two men want to get married. These two women, let it be. We don't want to hear that old-fashioned stuff. And it, it, this is in the Old Testament. One in 2,000 years, and no, nothing has changed. People are still the same. They do not want to hear about God. They do not want to hear about right and wrong. They don't want to hear it. They're sinners. They don't want to hear it. Their hearts are geared against God. Like the Bible says, from their youth. So understand, it's not a thing that if you do bad things, I've never hurt nobody. Maybe you haven't never heard of one. But have everything you've done in your life for the love of God? No one can lay claim to that except Christ Jesus. Now let's go to Psalms 51. This is David. Psalms 51, and I'll read 1 to 13. Okay. 
Psalm 51. Sinner's prayer for pardon. David was the great penitent. He was the great, he was also a great sinner. If you know the story of David, David was, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord. But guess what? He was a great sinner. He was a great penitent. He knew how to repent also. He never laid, laid claim to be perfect or anything like that, and then he was with the Lord, and the Lord had chose him. Mm. So, I mean, he acknowledges the fact what he was. He says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's acknowledging what he is. This is David. It says, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. This is... Uh, about what happened with him and Bathsheba. It says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So when God passes judgment on people or a person or a nation, or, or, or a nation he's justified. That's his right because we're all guilty. And, and, and you have to understand nations that God has judged, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Amalites, and he just brought down destruction. Man, woman, child, beast, all of them. There's no one perfect. You know, so David here recognizes, you know, his sin and what he is. He says, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And what David says here, he says, I have sinned against you and you only. Now, that's an important statement because, see, David recognized, and David recognized that what he did with the woman when he took her, that she was already married, Bathsheba, and then he had her husband, Uriah, put on the front line so he could be executed, killed, because it's harder on the front line in war. So David actually committed what you would call proxy murder. So, but David said, I sinned against you and you only God. But he sinned against the Uriah. He sinned against the Hittite and his wife. But what David recognized, and what we need to recognize is everything that we do wrong, even if you say something to someone and, and you go and apologize. Remember, you broke God's law before you ever did it to that person because they're his laws that he established. So whatever bad thing you do still, cheat, whatever you might do, lie, whatever, those things go against God first for the individual because they're his laws and uh, it goes on to say it says he says uh, verse 5 behold I was but here's David saying behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me he was born in sin so that closes the door and anybody think well babies don't yeah they got sinful natures mm -hmm. the Bible says you know we, we have sinful natures David said I was born and conceived in sin he knew what he was with a little kid so we have that we have this. So no one is, is, is exempt from God's judgment. God saves who he's going to save. But he's not obligated. He's not compelled or obligated to save anyone because we're all sinners. He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. He said, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost part. Again, what your heart is saying and why are you doing these things. He said, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. He says, Wash me, and I shall wither like snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. And he goes on and says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. See, David is asking the Lord to cleanse him. And he goes and says, Creating, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So what he's saying in here is creating me a new heart because he knows his heart. And when you know you're a sinner, see, if you have some preconceived notion that you're not that bad, you're in serious trouble. See, David knew that he was a rotten scoundrel. He knew it, but he loved the Lord. He knew how to turn. He wasn't going, he wasn't going to the Lord halfway and said, well, Lord, you know, remember what I did last week? Lord, that was a good thing, right? He's not even doing nothing like that. He's just simply saying, listen, put a clean heart in me and renew a steadfast spirit in me. And he says, do not cast me away from your presence. And he says, do not take your Holy Spirit. He says, do not take your Holy Spirit uh, away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and he says, sustain me with the willing spirit. So what he's basically doing is asking the Lord for help because he can't do it on his own. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. And that's what he's saying there. And he goes on to say, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just stop there at 13. He says, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners, sinners will be converted to you. He's using the word as sinners. Mm -hmm. So you know, when I open the floor of discussion, I, I want to try to get each person just to tell what you, know, what you think sin is and do you really believe that you are a sinner? Because we have to recognize who we are. If I, if I believe that I'm not a sinner and, and I'm not going to say I'm perfect, and if I say, well, Lord, I'm not that bad, then, then I'm not resting in the grace of God. I'm resting on some stuff that I'm holding. Like, you know, I can take this to heaven. He got, he got to recognize this here. You know, you got some, some stuff you're going to bring and give to the Lord outside of the work of Christ. Well, guess what? It's not going to work because he's only looking at the finished work of his son. 
Now let's go to the New Testament. We look at Romans chapter three, and this kind of seals the deal in the Lord Himself, like it is here. Romans chapter three, and I'll read ten to eighteen. I mean, and it can't get any clearer than, than this. I mean, but you'll still hear people say, "Well, I'm not that bad. I'm, I'm not a sinner." Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> you know, if you're born on this planet in this world. You are definitely a sinner. And the Bible is you know, it's either God telling the truth or you're telling the truth. So I put my faith in the finished work of Christ and the word here. Romans chapter 3, I'll read 10 to 18. And, and we have to understand, you know how there's people that you might know, either celebrities or, or just people in history, famous people, and you think about maybe the, the fine things that they've done. And, and, and they probably have done fine things. I'm not saying they haven't, but you, you have to understand that they're still sinners. Whatever they might have done, they're still sinners. Mm -hmm. 10 to 18, chapter 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek for God. Mm -hmm. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. Now when you read that, it doesn't mean that all have become useless, just everybody's just doing rotten things, so that doesn't apply to me. Even with your best deeds, or whatever, if you're out there doing you have a, a successful business, whatever, it's not done for the love of God. It all falls in this category. And it says, there's no one who does good. There's not even one. Okay, so that closes the door. No one. And it says, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of ash is under their lips. Whose mouths is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And, and you read that, you may say, see, see, that just pertains to killers. No. No, no. Everything falls. And that's why it says, there's no, not one. And it goes on and says, destruction and misery are in their paths. In the past of peace, they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes, and we know that to be true today, in politics, in schools, and the things that they're doing. And we go on and it says, um, I'm going to read 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. All the world has to become accountable to God. No one can say anything. You cannot stand before holy God and say anything unless you're perfect. His holiness alone demands perfection. It's just, a, it's, there's no way around it. His holiness demands perfection. That's why Christ came. And, and think about it. When Christ came, he was the only one that lived a perfect life and still had to die for what? For our sins. They had to be paid for. I'm going to read uh, another verse. It's going to be in Romans, go to chapter 8. I'm going to read 6 to 8. And this applies to everyone. It says, six to eight, uh, Romans 6 to 8 says, <clears throat> it says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Remember we read in Job, it says, We, don't, we do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Just like today, we don't want to hear about no Ten Commandments. We don't want to hear about no Dash or not. That's all ancient history. Let these people do what they want to do and get that Bible. They don't want to hear it. They don't want this because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. So basically, and, and, and you might not like wake up in the morning and plant a flag and say, I hate you, God, but we actually ultimately hate God. He's our mortal enemy. If God were to expose his divinity to mankind today, if he could do it, we'd kill him in a second. If, if it was possible, we'd look what they did to Jesus. <laughs> they, they killed him. If Jesus was here today and, and he was, came as a suffering servant, they would kill him again. They would kill him again. It says, so... It says, uh, the mind is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not even subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So what it's saying is you're not even able to love God on your own. Why? God has to come do the work in the heart. Now I love you. Faith is a gift. It is given to you to believe. And this is a testimony that it says, it says the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does, not, it does not even subject itself to the law of God. For it's not even able to do so. And also, in fact, when it says this, you're not even able to keep the Ten Commandments. The, the law it says, you're not even subject to the law, you're not even able to do so. You cannot do it because of your sinful nature. You can look at any individual you want. This person might be a bum, alcoholic, whatever. It doesn't matter. All sinners, all need the grace of God to get into heaven. So I can't look at someone who's in worse shape than me and say, look at that problem. I'm not, you know, I can't do that. You know, it's by the grace of God that I'm saved. And then that's it. Nothing, nothing of myself. So we have to understand that. And it says, verse 8, it says, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It doesn't say will not. Like you're willing to, well, I, I just decided not to please you today, Lord. It says cannot, which simply means impossible. You cannot please God if the Spirit does not dwell in you. The Bible clearly says no flesh should be justified in my sight. I mean, you've got to be perfect to stand before the Lord. 
Again, it doesn't mean that we went out and committed the worst crimes or anything like that. No, we haven't done things like that, but we have to also understand the, th the thoughts that we had. When Jesus teaches in the New Testament, he says, if you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery or fornication in your heart. Mm -hmm. Now, there's different degrees of sin, and obviously, if you actually commit the act, uh, uh, the penalty is going to be a little tougher society-wise than if you didn't do it, you just had the thought about it. Uh, there's going to be more ramifications, but the fact that even, if you had the, even though you had the thought of it, you still distort the clear and perfect teaching of God's law about you shouldn't do that. So it, it's still sin. But um, understanding what you are, understanding that you're dead in sin until God changes your heart, it opens your mind up to the other doctrines. Now I can appreciate grace. It actually humbles you because you know for a fact that you didn't do anything to deserve it. You know for a fact you didn't say, look, God, I found this fun now, so you got to let me in heaven. No. You're just thankful that he saved you and, and he had mercy on you. And that makes us humble, and that's how we can witness to other people without having some, you know, this image of, oh, well, God saved me because I'm better than you. No. God saved me because he just felt like doing it was his will. I definitely don't deserve it. We all deserve his wrath. And if he decided to punish all of us that way, it would be fine. It would be just because he would be just doing the just thing. Like the Bible says, you know, he's, not, he's not obligated to save anybody. Like the verse says in Romans, he says, so what it says is that all mouths are closed and that the whole world, may become accountable to God. The whole world. Okay, so that, that clearly God's word said that the whole world come account. So I can't claim anything. No one can claim anything. I can't say, Lord, you, you got to say my wife, she's a good woman. Uh, my, my son over here, he wasn't that bad of a fella. You know, he, nah, he's a sinner. Wife's a sinner. We're all sinners. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. And that in itself could send us to hell, will send us to hell, if he doesn't decide to have mercy and grace on us. So just to be thankful that he did save us and uh, had mercy on some, you know. And again, it keeps you in a humble state. So with that, I'm going to open the floor for discussion, and we're going to talk about am I a sinner? How do you feel about sin? How do you see sin today? And we'll talk about, the, you know, the various verses I read here. So the floor is now open. We've got a nice crowd here. Let's, the crowd's getting better and better. <laughs> That's I like that. I got Miss Annie in That's too. a blessing. Yes, it is a blessing. <laughs> Remember, we would have two, three. Remember, Mom, we have a few people here. But I was inspired by this study because, it, you know, you go out through the week and you hear things, and, you know, someone was saying something, well, go to the Catholic Church, and one of them well, I don't go to confession. No more. I have nothing to confess. I don't sin. I'm not a sinner. Or, you know, and it's like, no. <laughs> what planet are you from? But that's because they have a faulty view of sin. They just think that you have to do something be qualified as a sinner. The only thing you have to do to be qualified as a sinner is be born. That's it. <laughs> if you're born, you're a sinner. And that's the only way we get to the world. So, and that closes the door. So, even, you know, when you hear things about people who do bad things and atrocities, and, and they're all horrible things. You know, God allows evil in the world, and, and, and in this time, he brings good from it, but understand that those people are sinners. They, they, they're trapped and bound in their sins. But I can't look at that person, even though he might have, like, blew up buildings and stuff, and say, well, that rotten rice, I'm glad I'm not like that. I can't say that I'm better than him. Well, because if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be going where he's going if God didn't save him. So, and that's the, it's just the truth of it. It's just the truth of it. So it keeps us in a humble state, and, and we can't really judge anybody. But just to pray for those who are outside of the, uh, uh, the grace of God and ask that he saves more people. But we have to understand doctrine. We have to know this. And last week we did the whole thing on the exposing the false prophets. And the, mm. I'll get back to doing that again. Because it's important that this is taught. It's, it's important. Because if you have, we have a shallow view of it, you get in all kinds of trouble. You know, you get in all, and, and the Bible says to examine ourselves, to know that we're of the Spirit. Mm. Those things are important. So, are there any comments? Anything? I want you to tell me the difference between God's law and man's law. How about Ma's law? Well, <laughs> Ma's law. God's law. Well, let me answer it this way. I've got to keep it talking. God's law. <laughs> yeah, keep it talking. God's law are already written in man's heart. The reason man makes certain laws is because what's written in his heart. Now, it's distorted. It becomes faulty, but uh, uh, the, the laws are already written in us. Before he gave Moses the Ten Commandments on those tablets that he brought down, that's when he actually got the law. But the law in the heart was already there. And it is through our conscience. It's our conscience. And, and, and that's where we're born with that. Now, when, when you speak about man's law, if you're talking about from a political standpoint, man do bring in laws. and up, but still, Man still does, in all his decisions that he, that he makes, 
until it's become completely distorted, is based on an ethical belief within itself. So, um, and it's involuntary. So it's like if you, if you take something from someone who maybe not in society or live in society, who just lives in the jungle somewhere, and you, he's hunting you know, for his family, and you go and you steal his deer and run off, he sees you. Right away, without him even hearing about Jesus or anybody else in the world, he knows that it's wrong. He knows that you took something from him. Now, how does he know that? Because the law is in all of our hearts. That's why uh, the Bible teaches that no man would be an excuse. You know that there's something. That's why there's no such thing as an atheist. You know, they might claim to be an atheist. They just suppress the truth. You know that there's a God. You know, the Bible says that nature itself testifies of it. So our laws are based on what we are. We were created in the image of God. Now, man's image has been distorted because of sin, but it hasn't been completely destroyed. So we, in order for us to live in society, is by those laws that God has laid down. So we take that and we set up laws about we have judicial system you can't steal. And this is how we were able to cohabitate and live together. Now, um, th th those ideas come from what's already within. And it's the laws that God has written in our hearts. Now, anything outside of that, like I said, they can pass laws about take prayer out of school and stuff like that. That's just a distortion. But prayer has always been there. Man has always been someone who worships anyway. You know, whether it's the true God or not, because we were created for one way, what? To glorify God and enjoy it forever. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not a Christian and trusting and believing in God, you trust, you're doing something, something you're idolizing. Because, you know, so I hope that answers your question about that, that the, the God's laws are already basically within us. It, it, it's just distorted that God's grace isn't there, but we still set up things about, we know what, we know what right and wrong is. We just suppress it. You mean every person? Every person and every person's heart understands right and wrong in his heart. Yeah, we all have a conscience. Uh, now, there are people who minds might be, I'm not saying, but it's still, it's still there. They might, not they might not understand it, but they still have a conscience. Everyone I'm, is born has a conscience. I'm thinking about the uh, thing that's going on now about that guy, you know, did all those abortions. Mm -hmm. well, yes. I mean, evil, I mean, it just... Well, and, and you have to also understand that there's evil times evil when if you, if you sit enough or bad things happen enough, people can become hardened. Yes. To it. I think it's in the book of Jeremiah where he yes. speaks about it. He told the people of Israel, he said, you have developed the forehead of a harlot. Which simply means, what the verse simply means is that the first time the, 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 the harlot, the prostitute, went out to uh, you know, sell herself or whatever it is, she really felt bad. Conscience really kicked in. You can sear the conscience. You know, you do it a second time, not so bad. Third time. Fourth and fifth time, she's bringing in the crew. Come on, let's try this. And it's not, it's just the fact that she's seared. You know what I'm saying? So, it, the abortion, he's just gotten to that point. You know, it, it, you know that it's wrong, but you know, sin can pile up and things like that. And people have distorted ideas about when life starts and things like that. But obviously we're spiritual beings. You know, two people are together and they have a child, but you have to understand God gives the soul to a child, not you. You know, so all souls belong to the glory, that's what the Bible says. So. Anything else? Any more questions? Miss Annie, I know you got something. <laughs> I'm listening. She's listening. Okay. She's listening. I'm listening. Okay. Well, do you think that that we can uh, pray and ask forgiveness and and uh, be saved on our own accord? Well, to pray and ask forgiveness, I think, is something that God well, actually has to lead you to do anyway. Um, uh, if you're praying and ask for forgiveness. Uh, when you say on your own accord, you can pray and ask God for something. If you're guilty of something, if you've done something wrong, and you say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I mean, as long as, it, as, long as it's not confused with the fact that you just asked for forgiveness because you got caught, you know, that's the difference from praying for forgiveness because you're genuinely sorry and you want God to forgive you and save you. But it's God himself that brings you to that point. Now, on your own initiative, no, you can't, you can't save yourself. God has to come in and change the sinner's heart. Because like we just read, the, uh, the natural mind is hostile toward God, this is not even subject to the law, nor is it even willing to do so. And, and it says, it clearly says it cannot, you know. The verse says it cannot, the flesh cannot please God. Yes, Ms. Hannah. If you repent, if you repent and ask for forgiveness, doesn't he, he pay attention to that? That's sure, well, what is repenting? Mm -hmm. How do you repent? God brings you to repentance. Mm -hmm. um, repenting, j repenting means to turn around. Basically what the word means, means to turn around. To turn around from your, your old ideas. Now, if, if let's say that you used to, uh, 
let's say you used to drink, or let's say you used to be a heavy drink or something, and you stopped drinking. Well, that's a form of repentance. You turn around from now. That's not repentance under salvation. That just means you stopped drinking. All right, now repenting as far as repenting under salvation is when your whole life is turned around. You, you, you don't like sin anymore. You, you're still a sinner and you still sin, but you're looking to please God and all you're doing. And that you cannot do on your own outside of the grace of God. You can nice. drink, drop bad habits, and that's a form of repenting because you're turning from it. But it's not, uh, stop smoking cigarettes is not repenting under salvation. You just stop smoking cigarettes. So, but the part as far as salvation is concerned, God brings you to that point. God is the one who must move on the sinner's heart. Enabling you to repent, you must be, you know, you must be born again, and then uh, giving you the faith. In other believe. words, in order to repent and ask for forgiveness, you need to be born again. God has to do that. Saying. God has to do that. So that that would well, that's, that's why. What he told Nicodemus, wasn't it? That's what he told Nicodemus yeah. is that you must be born again. He didn't and understand it. He didn't understand it because he was. They were busy under the law. Just as so long as I do the law, I'm not killing these animals. I'm going to synagogue. I'm doing everything. See, they didn't understand that it was their disposition. It was their hearts that needed changing. And even if they searched the Old, the Old Testament, which they had, like in Genesis, God spoke of what? The heart, desperately sick. He was telling them, it's your heart. Jesus told them, said, search the scriptures. They didn't understand the scriptures. You know, but it, it was the heart that needs to be changed. And God is the one that brings you to true repentance and to salvation. You, know, you, you can't confuse that with you know, maybe dropping bad habits and things like that. So it's repenting and it's repenting unto salvation means turning around a different lifestyle and you know, you're being groomed to be more like Christ. And, and it's different for each individual that belongs to the Lord because we all go through different things. Anything else? Just to add to that a little bit, Randy, uh, the reason you can't just <clears throat> all of a sudden one day wake up, like she was saying, and so the day I think I'll get saved. The reason you can't is because, like Glenn said, when you're born, you're born dead in sin and you know how to spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Man, it's dead. So, so, so that's why we say that God has to make the first move because every person is dead spiritually mm -hmm. until God makes them alive. That's called regeneration, mm -hmm. and that and regeneration is an act which is uh, it's it, it's for something to be born out of, out of nothing. So, so God says the Bible says Ephesians two eight down about the word uses the word quickening. So. You, you can't just decide whenever you want to get saved, whatever time, because you're not going to do it because you're dead and you don't want to. So God chooses which time and which place that he chooses to first touch you, come to you, regenerate you. And what that does, it makes you spiritually alive for the very first time ever. And then you can begin to look through spiritual eyes to see what your condition is. And it's from then that God begins to work in you and gives you faith and gives you uh, repentance and, and what, what regeneration does that's why we say you can't just walk down the aisle and say I believe in Jesus and, and you're saved because you're dead and you're not going to do it if you do it there's one key, one key point that's very important and that is when God regenerates you he changes your very nature, right. you have a new nature. Mm -hmm. and, and some theologies don't require a change of nature they just require a mental ascent that Jesus is is, is the Christ, but that doesn't change the nature. Yeah, no, so you need that. So that change of nature is what's very important when you say it. And that's why, like you said in, in verse in verse seven, it says because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, which means it's impossible. It's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh, in other words, we're not born again, who don't have the spirit of God in them, cannot please God. And now, you can say whatever you want out your mouth, but it said the flesh is so, God has to do something. God has to come in, make that change. It says, oh, now I love him. Now I want it. Now you, every day, you just want to go and go out to please him. But it's just not anything you wake up and decide because you're hostile to him. You don't even like it. And that doesn't mean you plant a flag in front of your house and I hate God. No, it's just <laughs> your thoughts, your ideas, and things like that. It, it, it shows that you, know, you hate, you know, you, that you hate God and you're hostile toward him. The Bible says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It doesn't say that it is enmity. It doesn't say that at enmity. It says it is enmity, hatred itself, enmity against God, the carnal mind. And the only way you get rid of the carnal mind is you get the spiritual mind, but God gives you the spiritual mind. You don't change your mind from carnal to spiritual by yourself. Because if we could do that, we didn't need, then we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need the Holy Spirit to, to regenerate us. I just regenerate myself. But you can't do that. Can't so this, this doctor that I was talking about, there's hope. 
we don't know what could happen to him. No, just I'm like not saying no, no, no. As long as he's living and breathing each day, the Lord want to save him. He can save him. Right. But you see, when when God does things like that with people like that, uh, uh, God gets the glory. Because look at Paul. Paul was killing Christians, wasn't he? He was persecuting them. He was there when Stephen was stoned. He was holding the coats or the cloaks or whatever. He was stoning the man to death in the pit. And God took the same man to write two-thirds of the New Testament. So can you imagine what they were thinking? Paul, you just killed the guy last week. Now you're talking about Jesus Christ? What is he crazy? So, but God had changed it. That's a testimony that Paul didn't wake up that day and decide God struck him down on the road to Damascus. He said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And then he went ahead and he just laid it on him. He said, this is what you're going to do. And that's what he did. He didn't ask him. He told him. So he changed and converted Paul's, Paul's heart and used the man Amen. to give us two thirds of the New Testament. But see, God gets to. Was he in jail when he wrote those books? Paul was everywhere. He was on ships, in jail, out of jail, shipwrecked, running. He was a missionary. He was a missionary. He, he wasn't in no air conditioned place relaxing <laughs> like all these other pastors. And, oh, yeah, man of God. Nobody in the Bible had it like that. They, they, they had hard times. They really did. They, they, they had hard times. So, so regeneration. Is almost the same as saying uh, born again. They're synonymous. It's the same thing. Being born again, regenerated, quickening. And it's People all of God, no matter what you do. Oh, you, you can't change your nature. The Bible is getting leper change of spots. No. So you do. Can good. God change the leper spots? Yes. <laughs> you do good after you're regenerated. Well, because if if you if you, good, you, after you after you regenerate, then the things that you do, you obviously do want to please the Lord. Like yeah. Paul said. For the you know for the changes things I want to do changes your nature right for the things heart. that I want to do mean in, in, in other words Paul said in my inner part I love you and your law where before he didn't he says I love you and your law. he still fell short he still stumbled but God looks at the part that he you know that the fact that he wants to please him his heart has changed but ultimately even with all that we just still get him because of the finished work of Christ even that those, we those people that are regenerated are the only people that can go the day of judgment and say I'm no good I'm a sinner I'm only here through Jesus Christ right oh yeah well if you're born again you you you, you do mean, come to realize the fact that it wasn't you only you know you got in through the blood of Christ because it, it, it opens your eye like Bob said it gives you spiritual eyes you recognize and you realize what you are like David said in Psalms what did he say he said I was born in iniquity conceived in sin he said my sins are ever before me think about why that man must have felt being the king of Israel, uh, probably the greatest king of Israel, the greatest poet uh, uh, of Israel, the greatest psalm writer of Israel, and 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 he did this thing with this man, this woman, and other things he did. I imagine how he felt, you know, and that had to make him feel best. So he wrote it all down. He said, "I'm a sinner." He said, "You know, cleanse me." He wasn't on no high horse. You feel he could have been. He was the king, but he wasn't. He knew what he was. He knew what he did. And he just simply said, "God, you know, I'm sorry." Forgive me, whatever, and, and, and that's what you do. So you, you look at people like that, you know. Lynn, um, let's say one thing about R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, yes. Yeah, that, one of my that, favorites. We, we got this theologian we really like, this main Sproul, and he, he said there's there's two different ways to look at salvation. Uh, one's called synergism, which means two people have to do something to make a thing come through, to, to come to pass. And that is, the man has to cooperate with his own, with God, in order to have salvation. And that, and that, in that sense, the person will have faith first, and that would cause regeneration, and man would be having a part in his salvation. But he said there's another concept which we believe, which is monergism, which means only one person, one entity, causes something to happen. In other words, God would be completely in control of our salvation. And he said, a professor wrote on a blackboard one day, and said, what comes faith, uh, what comes first? Faith, then regeneration? Or does regeneration come first, causing faith? And I used to believe that faith came first, but then I, and, and it caused my faith, my own personal faith would regenerate me. But then when I found out and realized that I was dead, and you couldn't have faith, I had to look at it a different way. So, so what we believe is that, that regeneration comes first and causes faith. So actually faith and repentance are fruits of salvation and regeneration. They're fruits of regeneration. They're not the cause of regeneration. 
And that makes a big difference. Faith is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. He gives us the faith. Right, the Bible says it is given to you to believe, not that you muster it up. Yeah, that's right. It's given to you. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's to say, well, I think I better choose the Lord. That sounds like a good idea. It doesn't work like that. Don't you think reading the Bible, constantly reading your Bible, bring you closer to about salvation? Reading your Bible yeah. enlightens you, strengthens you. We're supposed to read our Bible. Yeah. I know we're supposed to, yeah. But if you do, because I feel like reading the Bible is just like talking to God. Well, it is. You, this is where we get our answers from. It's, you know, this is yeah. the written word, and God speaks yeah. through us through His word today. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Yeah, they say stay with the word of God. Sure, mm -hmm. that's true. Well, it's definitely a good study today. I enjoyed it. The topic, even though I have in store for us next week. Nice, because discussion. Right? <laughs> One thing: Amen. if you're a lost person, you're not going to read the Bible. That's right. Yeah, that's so you right. already know that yeah. there's something going on in you. You, you know, some people, yeah. some people come to church <laughs> with their nice Bible. Listen to the sermon everything. Look at that. Go home. Collect us until well, one day the Lord might strike them down like He did Paul. Uh, then they'll start rewriting. Right. <laughs> That's what happened. Amen. <laughs> 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 Paul wasn't listening to him either. We're gonna go ahead and close the prayer. <laughs> I gotta get you closer. Right. Oh, We're gonna go ahead and close the prayer. Oh, and Okay. Pastor Bob, would you like to uh, yes. close yes, up prayer? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord. We had a good Bible study. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, take these words that have been said today, Lord. And, and Lord, just with the Holy Spirit, help everyone here to be able to really grasp and understand what has been said and give them wisdom, Lord, spiritual wisdom that they can see that salvation is all of you, Lord. And, and we just thank you for this good study. We thank you for our discussion. And we thank you, Lord. It's been a, just a wonderful Bible study today. And we pray you just go with all of us, increase our understanding, give us wisdom. And Lord, just use us to bring glory to you today. In thy name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.